Professor Higginbottom, here for a session of science and fun. adventure we'll be having fun while we look for the answers to some scientific questions questions I'll ask in just a moment but first I want you to listen to some clues that will help keep you on the right track the people you see as more people get into a roller coaster the amount of energy needed to lift the car to the top of the first hill goes up too. Motors, by means of chains and gears, furnish the energy to lift the car to the high point of the track, the peak of the first hill. As the car reaches the top, it is freed from the gears and chains. It's time for the questions. Question one. What happens to all the energy used to lift the car and the people to the top of the first hill? Question two. Why is the first hill the highest? Question three. Where, during the whole ride, does the car move the fastest? Question four. If one G represents a person's normal weight due to gravity, does a rider experience more or less than one G of force at any time during a roller coaster ride? The professor's question sparked a lot of curiosity in one group of his viewers. But interestingly enough, each one brought up a different way to get the answers. One of them thought the best way would be to use the traditional scientific approach, figure out a theory for why the answer had to be such and such, and then set up experiments to test the theory. Another thought that the professor's clues about energy probably meant the answers had something to do with energy too. Why not go to the library and read up on the subject? A third suggested that possibly the questions could be answered by simply taking a ride on a roller coaster and thinking about whatever could be observed firsthand. If you want to know about G-forces, why not write an astronaut or somebody at NASA? Questions, questions. Scientists use all of these ways to find answers, and any or all of them may work. Watch. My theory is that the energy from the motorized part of the ride is what carries a roller coaster up and over the rest of the hills. The professor made a point about how the motors that furnish the energy to get a roller coaster to the top of its first hill are disconnected before it starts down. I think my experimental roller coaster has to be handled the same way, not getting any energy except what it takes to lift it just to the brink not getting any extra push or shove so it isn't affected by anything except gravity and whatever else is involved. Like that. What I want to see now is whether it ever gets any higher on the other side than it was when it started to fall. Hmm, from here to here. Let's try that again, once more. Well, that seems to explain it. Just like I thought, a roller coaster never quite makes it back up even with where it was when it started. It loses some of its energy somewhere 
Could it be to friction from the track or wind resistance? But anyway, that answers one of the professor's questions. Why is the first hill the highest? Because it has to be, or there won't be energy enough left to get it over the other hills. You've got something on your mind. Can I help? Didn't you tell us that momentum is equal to the mass times the velocity? I hope that's what I said. Why? Nothing yet. I'm still thinking. As more people get into a roller coaster, they increase the amount of energy needed to lift the car to the top of the first hill. More people. That means more mass. And if momentum equals mass times velocity, maybe starting with a greater mass will give me enough momentum to overcome the energy loss. Get it figured out? I don't know. I'm wondering if increasing the mass might not make it coast on over. Go ahead and check it out. Hmm, that's funny. The greater mass doesn't seem to make any difference. Well, what happened? It still doesn't rise quite as high as it falls. Did you try it at different heights, too? Yeah, with both masses. So, whatever the mass or the distance of travel, the energy loss is always enough to keep a roller coaster from going back up quite as high as it came down. So why did the professor give us that clue about more people taking more energy? Maybe because he wanted you to see that energy is different from momentum. Maybe you're supposed to be concentrating on different forms of energy. Here we are, chapter 12. What goes up must come down. That sounds like just what I'm looking for. And here's something on roller coasters, exactly what I'm after. The work done by the electric motor in raising the car to the top of the hill gives the car energy due to its position, or potential energy. A ski lift does the same thing for skiers, imparting potential energy, or position energy, by doing the work necessary to get them to a high place on the slopes. A diver, too, gains position energy by mounting the steps of the diving platform. The more steps, the more position energy. But position energy changes into other kinds of energy. Most noticeably, it changes from position energy into the energy of motion, often called kinetic energy, as the car loses height and gains speed. By the time the car reaches the bottom of the first hill, on a level with its starting point, almost all of that energy of position has been turned into the energy of motion. It is this energy of motion which moves the car up and over the second and shorter hill without stopping. But as the downward plunge begins, most of the car's energy is again position energy. Energy of position, energy of motion. If the swings back and forth between the two kinds of energy were complete, a roller coaster ride might go on forever. However, a third form of energy, heat from the friction of the wheels rubbing against the axles and the tracks, heat is continuously draining off energy from the supply initially furnished by the motor. And some of the original energy is also lost to friction between the moving car and the air, as well as between the people in the car and the air. The greater the mass, that is, the more people there are on the ride, the greater will be the friction between the car and the tracks, and between all the moving bodies and the air. Uh-huh. So that's the answer to the professor's question about what happens to the energy that came from the roller coaster motor. The energy is used to do the work of careening the cars over all the ups and downs, changing first from the energy of position to energy of motion and back again, over and over. But at the same time, it is also being used up by friction so that there is less and less and less until finally, there isn't any more usable energy.
What I intend to do is find out for myself at what point in the ride the car is moving the fastest. While I'm at it, I think I can figure out the answers to the professor's questions about G-forces, too. Now, if I can just sort out what happened and why. The professor's questions about G-forces and where you go the fastest were to get us to think about gravity, I'll bet. Gravity and what happens when you change direction. When you get to the highest point, with nothing to hold you back, the force of gravity takes over. And the further something falls under the force of gravity, the faster it goes. That's why you're going the fastest just before you hit bottom the first time. Because you've just fallen the greatest distance you can fall on the ride. And then you change direction. From down to up, like a crack the whip. And anybody who's ever played crack the whip knows there's another force involved when you change direction traveling in a curve. It's the force exerted toward the center of a curve by a human chain. A real force, as anyone soon finds out who's on the end when the force is broken. The person freed from that force toward the center skids off in a straight line, instead of continuing around the curve with the others. And the faster it is, the more force it takes to keep it all moving in the same arc. I've got a hunch both things are working on a roller coaster. The downward force of gravity, plus a force toward the center as you change direction in a curve. It's both of them together that make you feel like you weigh a ton. But funny, I couldn't feel a force toward the center. Just the opposite. I felt like there was only one thing, gravity pulling me down. Only it was stronger than gravity. Sometimes our feelings can fool us. But the scientist who was willing to push personal feelings aside to let his mind explore sometimes makes interesting observations. Wait a minute. In a crack the whip, it's the hands linked together that exert force toward the center. But in a roller coaster, it's the track that makes the car move through the arc. It's the track that exerts the force toward the center. Could that be right? Is that the way it is? Two forces? One pulling you down, the other pushing you up? I wonder. Perhaps this information on simulated gravity in space will help you understand some of the forces at work in a roller coaster ride. Here at NASA, we've determined that spinning of the space station will provide astronauts of the future with a sense of gravity. An object moving in a circle is constantly moving along an arc and thus must have a force toward the center called centripetal force acting on it to keep it orbiting. Sometimes it's a visible force, as here, where centripetal force is exerted by a cord swinging a ball in a circle. Sometimes it's invisible, as when the force of the Earth's gravity keeps the moon in orbit. In the case of the space station, it's the outer wall, or what the occupants think of as the floor, which pushes against the astronaut's feet to keep them in orbit around the center of the wheel. Without the centripetal force of that outer rim, the astronauts would fly off into space. But the outer rim, the centripetal force, is there. And when the space station spins at just the right speed, that force against the astronauts' feet feels just like the force of gravity felt on Earth, a simulated gravity. Yeah, but what's this got to do with roller coasters? Sure, a roller coaster has lots of curves. Places where centripetal force is involved. But the push of centripetal force must always be toward the center of the curve to keep the riders in the arcs. So the push changes. The centripetal force must be up at the bottom of the dips, down at the top of the hills, which may not be the way it feels to the riders. But remember how astronauts in a space station mistakenly feel that a force is holding them down to the outer rim when actually it is centripetal force pushing the rim up 
against their feet in simulated gravity. Well, in the same way, a roller coaster rider who feels like he's being squashed down against the seat is actually being pushed up by the centripetal force causing him to change direction as the car changes. When the car changes direction, either at the bottom of the dips or going into curves, it pushes on you to make you change direction too. Even though you feel like you're doing the pushing against the car, it's really the other way around, thanks to centripetal force. If the car has enough energy of motion as you go over the top of a hill, if you have just the right speed, the force needed to change your direction from up to down along the arc that the car is following may be just equal to your weight. So the only force necessary to keep you in the arc is that of gravity. Neither your safety belt nor the seat are exerting any pressure on you in this case. Presto, you feel like you're floating on air. You are experiencing weightlessness relative to the roller coaster car for just an instant. Professor, your answer is yes. You can experience both more and less than one G of force on a roller coaster. If everything's just right, you can even know what it feels like at zero G's. Weightlessness. And now that you've answered all the questions, I'll bet you're ready to start on some new problems about ups and downs. Uh, okay, here are some dandies. First question. How can they design loop-the-loop -loop roller coasters so that the car doesn't fall off during the ride? Second question. Suppose you have a ski lift. The work needed to lift the people to the top of the slope and thus the energy of position gained is the same no matter how the skiers come down. Now, if some of them choose the very steep slope and some of them choose something not quite so steep, Will there be any difference in the energy of motion achieved by the skiers at the bottom of the two slopes? Third question. How does this amusement park attraction work? And finally, does the weight of the people in the roller coaster have anything to do with how fast it will go at the bottom of the first dip? When you look for the answers, remember, all's fair in the ups and downs of science. You can experiment, you can ask questions of the experts, you can dig the answers out of books, or you can simply think everything through to a conclusion. And that's what this is, a conclusion. See you next time. Goodbye.